ball boy growing up in Portland, as you know, from 85 to 88. Uh, uh -huh. Jack Ramsey was our guy. When I walked in, uh, when I left out of there and went away to college, uh, Rick Adelman was the guy and so was Mike Schuler. Um, now, during those days, there were only a handful of international players who began coming into the league. Um, I can remember us drafting Arvidas Sabonis, and mm -hmm. we know what his son is able to do in Indiana. Right. Mm -hmm. um, for the international game, talk about what it was like for you to go overseas and play and how the players were at that particular point in time. And, and again, uh, there was a couple Americans on some of those rosters uh, going over to play during those days. Right. Well, you know, the, at that time, the European basketball is still totally different because they believe in teaching the fundamentals. You know, they, you, it was no really post up part of the game in Europe at that time, you know. It was pick and rolls, a jump shot, basically like the guys that are playing now. And they were very good in ball handling because they start out at such a young age that they work on the fundamentals. And you, even you notice now, a lot of the European guys, they're very fundamentally sound. And they have good good jump shots. They, they know how to play the pick and roll. But at that time, that's, that's what they worked on, you know. And it did every day. You know, we practiced twice a day. And they really spent a lot of time on that. But now, um, I think when I end up coaching in Dallas, um, I think we end up getting one foreign player in Dallas. I'm not for sure. I think we got one foreign player when I was in Dallas coaching. But um, that's when it's kind of start opening up a little bit more. Uh, Don Nelson really brought in a lot of the foreign guys, and that kind of opened up the whole whole situation. And of course, um, the dream team kind of really took it to another level because everybody wanted to play basketball after the dream team. And that's when you see a lot of guys that are playing now and playing then because of the dream team. 1987 through 1993, the reunion arena, uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, the reunion ball, that big green ball. Right. Uh, you go in there and when you go into Dallas, you had to be ready to play and uh, Coach Hurd was there with his clipboard. Uh, take us into those experiences for you and what it was like for you to be an assistant and then uh, the head coach of the Dallas Mavericks. Well, it, it was great when uh, Coach McLeod got the job in Dallas. You know, he asked me that I wanted to go with him. And, of course, I did because he took over for Dick Mata. And the first year or two there, I mean, we, we, we was pretty good. We got to – I think we ended up playing the Lakers in my first year there. In some kind of way, the Lakers always ended up beating us. But uh, it was a great experience, you know, learning experience, because I really didn't know a lot about coaching. So basically, I had to learn from Coach McLeod and how he pre prepared everything, the practices and all of that. So uh, it worked out really, really good. I mean, I was back into basketball, which I really wanted to do. And, uh, and I had to give him credit for taking a chance on me. And um, after that, I was with him until they released him in Dallas. Then Richard Adabata took over. And um, we, we wasn't that good that year. I mean, we, we was probably the worst team in the league. And uh, when Richard was released, I ended up finished coaching the team at that time, uh, at the end of the year. And I thought I had a chance to uh, maybe get the job, but uh, the owner decided to hire Quinn Buckner. So I ended up going to Indiana as assistant with Larry Brown. And that's why I spent a lot of my years after that with Larry as an assistant coach. Now, what was Indianapolis like? Uh, Meridian, uh, Market Square Arena, uh, downtown Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, the basketball capital. Uh, what was it like to uh, be there on that coaching staff um, and, and Reggie Miller and some of the guys who were there uh, to listen and, and take heed to what you guys were offering? You know, that was a team that was fun to coach. Um, you know, Larry, Larry was more of a teacher. But we had guys like Reggie, Rick Smith, the Davis brother, you know, so and uh, it, it was a fun team, you know, and the practice was more, more exciting, I think, than the game because the guys were very competitive in practice, you know. They, no one wanted to lose. And it, it was, we had a very good team. And, and the city was, you know, basketball crazy anyway. So we had a very, very good team. You know, we always end up getting into the quarterfinals or the finals, the Eastern Conference finals, but uh, we never couldn't make that extra step over. You know, we run into the Knicks, um, you know, in game seven, and we run into, I can't remember who else that beat us. But we, 
that team with Reggie and Rick Smith and the Davis boys, um, then we had a good bench, you know, with uh, Sam Mitchell and Haywood, a lot of Vern Fleming. So we had a lot of guys that wanted to win, know how to win. And so they made our starters better because they, they would put it on the starters in practice. So um, it, it was a fun team to coach, you know. That was, that was probably my most fun memory of coaching, you know, because the Indiana team was a fun team to coach. And Larry was a fun guy to work, work for, you know, because uh, Larry always tried to, you know, he always dickering and changing things. So it, it, it kind of, it, it, it kind of like uh, <laughs> he's a teacher on the floor, you know, as a coach, he's out teaching all the time. Um, so I, I have to give him credit. And also, if I look back over my career, I had a chance to either play for or, or work for some of the greatest coaches in the NBA. You know, I started out with Lenny Wilkins. You know, go to Chicago with Dick Martin, Jack Ramsey in Buffalo, John McLeod in Phoenix. You know, and then Larry, Larry, John McLeod also as assistant coach in Dallas. Then Larry in Indiana, and I had Larry up until um, I went to Washington as a head coach. So I had I had some great teachers. So I learned a lot of basketball over the years. Coach Hurd was uh, Byron Scott. People forget uh, after he left the Lakers, he played on a few other teams. Was he with the Pacers during that era? I forgot to mention him. Byron Scott was another guy on that team. And, um, yeah, we played uh, we played Orlando for, you know, uh, I think to get to the finals. And he was on that team. Byron Scott, he, he was kind of like the veteran leader because he had been in that situation before. So everybody kind of looked at him as, as, as a veteran leader. And um, he had some big shots for us against Orlando, you know, to take it to, to the seventh game. So I, I, I don't know how I can leave him out of that situation because he was a key part of the team. Next stop, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, you bring in a guy like Allen Iverson uh, from Georgetown. Um, take us into Philly in those days and what it was like with those great fans. Philly, <laughs> very unusual city. <laughs> it was, but it was a fun city. And, you know, then we had the Allen there, of course. Um, John, you know, Larry was a, a guard in, in the pros, right? So, you know, he was always tough on his point guards. You know, even on Allen, he was tough. But Allen was a special talent. And um, he, he just, uh, Larry liked to try to control, keep him under control a little bit. But, you know, Allen, the way he played, you had to let it go. And he was fun to watch, man. He could, he could do a lot of things for his size and his speed and quickness. But and people don't realize how strong it was. But he he was he was really fun to watch, and and the team was fun, you know. It was really fun to, with that team. Um, we had, we had a really really pretty good team there, and um, you know I, I'm looking back over some of the some of the guys that was on the team, you know, and uh, all of them was, was solid players, you know. But Philly Philly is another one of my favorite cities. I, I think the, the favorite cities that I want love to live in was Chicago. Philly and Phoenix, you know, I love Buffalo because of the team, but it wasn't a city that I thought I would end up living in, <laughs> but uh, those three cities I wouldn't mind living in and I end up living in Phoenix. Next stop, Detroit basketball, the Detroit Pistons. <laughs> Take us into Motown and what that experience was like for you personally. Yeah, you know, the year before they had won the championship. So, you know, coming there, you know, and I figured with the same team, it, it, was, it was very good with Rashid, Ben Wallace, Chauncey, Big Hamilton, and those guys. So, you know, I said, well, maybe I get a chance finally to win a ring. And uh, <laughs> so we, we really had a good year. We uh, got to the, to the um, NBA Finals and ended up playing San Antonio. And it was, uh, I think it was tied at 2-2, I believe. And we had a chance to win the one game, uh, to, to take the lead in the series. And uh, I'll never forget, um, Robert Ory hit a three-pointer to, to win the game in that, in that series. And, you know, from one mistake that we made on defense, we ended up leaving him wide open for a three-pointer that kind of won the game for them. And we go to San Antonio. And I believe we won the game, first game in San Antonio. And then game seven, they ended up beating us. So I got close a couple of times, but never got the ring. 
the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., the Washington Wizards. Uh, we know them as the Washington Bullets, Wes Unseld and the guys. Uh, what was it like to coach in Washington? Um, it was an experience, i put it that way. Uh, it, it, we had, it's kind of like the Clipper team. We had a lot of guys that was going in different directions. So we really, you know, we had Rod Strickland there who, who um, was supposed to be the best player there. And it was just hard to get those guys together. You know, it, it was like, you know, um, okay, we, we win a game and a couple of guys will show up for practice the next day. So Rod, Rod Strickland really didn't like to practice. So you never know what you're going to get from him at that time. Um, so that team was, um, you know, if I had to do it over again, I probably would have passed on that situation and waited for a better opportunity. But, you know, when you get a chance to become a head coach, you can't, you can't pick and choose. And uh, that probably was the, one of the mistakes that I made. But I ended up coaching in the NBA and becoming a head coach. And it, it, this didn't work out. It never really got a chance to put the team together that we wanted to put together because the, uh, the owner sold the team. Um, part of the team, and they end up making a lot of changes when he brought in Michael as the uh, the general manager, and that didn't work out. So, and, and it took them a while to recover from all of that. But it was I, I give them it was experience, you know. Uh, a Poland, you know, he he really liked me. He said, "I want you to coach this team," and so it worked out well. Next stop, the A, the ATL. Uh, let's go downtown, the Omni Hotel, CNN. Uh, you look at the basketball arena right there. Um, take us inside the arena there, and you're back home in the uh, great state of Georgia, and uh, you are guiding the Atlanta Hawks. What was that like for you? It was – I always wanted to, to play in Atlanta. Never got a chance to play in Atlanta. So I got a chance to coach there in – I think I was on the golf course. I think I got a call from Lon Kruger, who just got the job there and wanted me to be one of his assistants. And so, I mean, I couldn't turn that down because I got a chance at least to be a part of the city and part of the Hawks. Um, it was it was a good experience. You know, Lon coming out of college, so it was a different situation here. So he had to prove himself to the players. And, you know, the team was – wasn't that good, I should say that much. So, but uh, we over the, over the course of time, we kind of worked out. Everything worked out pretty good, but it just didn't, didn't work out for him and the coaching staff because I think he didn't he didn't last very long. But we had, we formed a great relationship while I was in Atlanta with with Lon, and so he um, he was the type of guy that you know you you you, you got to love the guy. He 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 was the type of guy that loved everybody. And so when he offered me the job and we, we talked and I, and I took the job and he kind of explained to me what, what he wanted to do. And so I kind of talked to him a little bit about the, the player, about the NBA, because that's his first job in the NBA. And um, so it worked out really well. The, the, the relationship that I formed with him at that time is still strong today. So I, I give him credit for that. Just too bad that it didn't work out because he didn't really, I think, got a fair chance of being, you know, a head coach in the NBA for a long period of time. Life after the NBA, uh, life after basketball, as you move forward, uh, take us into what it's like these days and play golf and really enjoy yourself and your family. And, and what is it like these days for you? Well, you know, when I first uh, retired from basketball, you know, I had two, two young kids. So I got a chance to watch them grow up, you know, um, so it was fun, and then I, they got a chance to, to see me work as a as a coach, you know, in Dallas and everywhere else. So they they had fun because they was they felt that they were special. But you know, and after that, after finished coaching, I just kind of like, hey, I've done it all. Now I think I just want to try to just kind of relax and watch them grow up. And they, you know, they, they all went to college, so I got a chance to see my son play in college at Penn State. Yeah. You know. My daughter gave up basketball in high school, but, you know, she went to Hampton. So, you know, it, it was kind of fun, you know, because I got a chance to spend a lot more time with my family, with my mom, who was at that time was, was kind of get, kind of sick. So I got a chance to spend a lot of time with her. And, and now 
you know, I'm just out in Phoenix, just kind of relaxing, recovering. You know, when I tell you about my back, it finally caught up with me. So I had back surgery about two years ago. And um, now I'm just here recovering and enjoying the sunshine. And every now and then I try to get down and hit the golf ball. Awesome. When you look at the current NBA, uh, guys are not posting up as much. Uh, you're seeing pick and pop. You're seeing screens being set. And guys are letting it fly. They're shooting three-pointers, you know, just just all the time. Um, take us into this game, what you see so far. Well, I see a lot of European game in this in the NBA today. And uh, the three-point shot is taken over from everything else. And, you know, the one thing about the three-point shot, it can shoot you in a game and shoot you out of a game. And uh, what I see now is that you have some great three-point shooters, but you also have some guys that think they're three-point shooters. So, and they end up taking some shots at the time that end up costing their, their team. But uh, it's it just like the game now is more like three-point pick and roll. The big guy is almost non-existent in the league now. You know, you, you, it, it's hard to find a, a team that had a big guy. Denver have a big guy that can post up, you know. Uh, but you rarely find guys that are, that are posting up now. It's all about pick and roll shooting the three. And I think the league now figured out that I'd rather take a three than a two because I got a chance to, you know, if I make the three, I'm okay. And I, I just don't see the game the way they see it now. I, I think they shoot too many threes, you know, at the wrong time. I think the right guys can shoot them anytime they want to. But a lot of guys, you know, they think they're open, so they want to shoot threes. and They have no chance of making those. But that's the way the league is now. You know, you make one or two, three, you think you're a three-point shooter. Everybody want to be Steph Curry now. So it doesn't work that way. Coach, back in the days, uh, the top eight seeds went into the playoffs. Now you have eight seeds in the playoffs, but you also have the play-in game format. We're right. at uh, team nine and ten. You know, those teams are able to battle out to try to get into the playoffs. Uh, through desperation, through those series, the elimination process. When you look at uh, the current setup, what do you see? I, I like the old style. I would like if, you, if you're the top eight, you should be in the playoffs. You know, I, I think you have a whole season to, to get to that position. So if you get lucky and become, you know, in the playoffs and, and win a couple of games, well, I think it hurt the team that, that was there the whole year. And um, I think it's good for the rating for the NBA, you know, because uh, they get extra games for TV. But I just like the old, old style. If I play 82 games, and if I'm number seven and eight, I want to I, I be in the playoff. I don't have to play an extra game or two to get into the playoffs. Hey, Coach, as we look at the top teams right now, Golden State is in the one seed at 29 and seven. Uh, your Phoenix Suns are the two seed. 29 and eight, uh, only a half a game behind. The Utah Jazz are three. Uh, Memphis is four. Denver Nuggets at the five spot. Your Dallas Mavericks are six. Six. The LA Lakers are seventh. And uh, the Clippers, uh, another franchise you play with in Buffalo, are, are the eight seed. Uh, Minnesota, nine. And Sacramento is 10. Um, when you look at this current. Uh, playoff seeding in these teams, uh, what do you see? Well, I, I think Golden State, Phoenix, and probably Utah, the three top team in the West, and it's going to be hard for a team to catch them. Uh, Memphis is a dark horse. I, I never thought they would be that good this year, uh, but I, I have to give them credit for number four. It's going, and I think if they keep playing the way they're playing, they're going to be okay. But but Denver is going to move up. Uh, I think I think People are still down on the Lakers, but I think the Lakers are going to move up to probably five or six. Uh, you know, if they get – once they get Anthony Davis back, they should move up. But I think it's going to be a dogfight for the last four or five spots. I think the top three spots are pretty much locked in. Uh, it's going to be a battle all the way down the wire to with Golden State, Utah, and Phoenix, you know. Everybody's talking about Golden State, Phoenix, but no one is giving Utah a lot of credit. And they uh, they are pretty good, too. And, and don't go to sleep on Memphis. They're young, but they're, they're hungry. Coach, uh, LeBron James, uh, can you talk about that gentleman as a talent? Uh, every time you look up, he's breaking another record. Uh, he's able to play at a high level, and I'm sure he has a trophy case that's, that's unreal. Can you just speak about uh, LeBron James? 
he is the best I've seen all around. I mean, he can do almost anything he wants to do. Uh, you know, he, he can score, he can rebound, he can pass the ball. And he, he used to be a very, very good defensive player. But he, that type of talent come along probably once in a lifetime. And you have to enjoy it. But I, I really enjoy watching him play. Uh, I think he's starting to develop his three-point shot because as you get older, you can you know, go in there and pound like you did when you're a young guy. So he, he know how to adjust his game to, to, to fit his style. And health-wise, he's taking care of his body. But the main thing about him, he has a great mind for basketball. He knows the game and, and he knows the situation when he's in when he's in a situation, what to do. And if I have to think about all the players that I've seen play over time, I've had to put him at the top because he could do a lot more than the rest of the guys, you know. Yeah, guys that could score, guys that could rebound, but you never had a guy that could play an all-around game like he's playing. And he's probably going to be one of the top players in every category by the time he finished playing. Coach, how good was Michael? Uh, I remember him as a ball boy, you know, getting shoes and autographs and what have you and mm -hmm. watching him compete. Uh, how good was Michael Jordan? He was great. You know, he, he was the guy that took the game to another level. Uh, he, he was fantastic. And, you know, he was a guy that you could guard. Uh, he, he was – it was first of bird and magic when Micah took over from those guys and elevated it another level. And um, I don't think anybody has done much for the game as he did while he was playing. And, uh, you know, then you had to put, after he left, LeBron took it to another level. So, but Michael, everybody say he's the best ever. You know, I think he was the best in his generation. You know, I think uh, when he started playing, one thing people don't realize, in the early day, there was no TV. So you didn't get a chance to see guys play maybe the Celtics and the Lakers and the Sixers and the Knicks were the four teams that you always saw on TV. But once the, the TV kind of expanded, you saw the guys. You see guys play every night now, so you can see how good they are. And it's, it's kind of a shame that you didn't see how good the older guys were. But in the new generation, I think you had to put Michael, Kobe, LeBron, um, Magic, Bird, those guys in a different category than the older guys. Coach Hurd, uh, talk a little bit about the late, great Kobe Bean Bryant. He was a guy like Michael who was coming to the arena for a purpose. He wanted to win, and he was coming in, and I'll use the Dr. J analogy. Uh, he was coming in to operate and try to get it done. Yes. You know, he had that killer mentality, you know, and um, when he stepped on the court, you know, it was about winning. It was about, about, about defeating you, about beating up or killing you. And that was his mentality. And um, talent-wise, you know, he could, he could do a lot of things too. But he was a guy that mentally, probably mentally tougher than anybody that, that I've seen play when he was out there. Because, you know, when he wanted to do something, you know, you couldn't stop him from doing it. He was kind of like Michael. He, he developed. Shots as he as he got older, he developed his game to a part where he could do basically whatever he wants to. And like like you say, Doctor J say, you know, he come to operate and he operated a lot. <laughs> you know, uh, it was kind of sad the way things happened. But uh, you know, if I had to pick certain guys I want to watch play, Kobe would have been one. Michael, LeBron, Magic, Bird. Uh, that's the younger guy. The older guys. I love to watch guys like Wilt, Elgin, Russell, Jerry West, Oscar Robinson. That, that's in a different category, but I, I grew up watching those guys. But the younger generation, I have to put those guys that I just named. And I, I would probably pay to watch them. And I normally would pay to watch an NBA game, but those guys I would pay to watch. Coach, uh, the, de the debate continues. Um, and we've watched uh, Steph Curry shoot the ball from half court and uh, his jumper is, as the young people say, is wet. I mean, he can really shoot the basketball and revolutionize the game. And we know what his father did in Dale Curry. Um, right. Can you talk about Steph when you see him as a competitor and, again, the ability to shoot the ball from anywhere he wants to? Yeah, you know, and everybody get hung up on you know, how he shoot the ball, where he shoot the ball from. But if you watch his game, you know, he can get his shot anytime he wants to. He can also drive the ball to the basket. He can get in, he can get inside, hit the mid-range shot. So he had the type of game, and he never stopped moving. He kind of reminded me of Havlicek when he don't have the ball. He's always moving to get open. And uh, 
he, no question about it, he's the best shooter ever. You know, I, I can't compare anybody to, as well as shooting the ball the way he does. You know, he has range. He can hit from the mid-range. And he also can get his teammates involved. So I, I have to give him credit right now. And I don't see anybody topping what he's doing as far as shooting the basketball because it's unreal. You know, you never you never thought you'd see a guy just raise up from where he's shooting the ball from. You know, the the thing that I hope that doesn't happen. You know, because he's they, he don't get worn down this year. Maybe when Clay come back, that'll take some of the pressure off of him because right now he's pretty much one of doing it all on his own, basically. You know, all the scoring, so he he get worn down. You know, he's not shooting a great percentage like he used to. And I think that's got a lot to do with him not getting a lot of rest. Coach Hur, the Eastern Conference, as it stands right now, uh, your Chicago Bulls are the top seed, number one. They're 25 and 10. Uh, Brooklyn Nets are in second, 23 and 12, two games behind. The mm -hmm. Milwaukee Bucks with Giannis, they're uh, in third. They're 25 and 14. Miami's the fourth seed. Your Philadelphia 76ers are fifth. Cleveland is six. Your Washington Wizards are seven. Charlotte's in the eighth seed. And of course, uh, in terms of play in, Toronto is, is nine and the Celtics are 10. Uh, take us through the East and what you see there. I, I think, and I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I think when it comes down to it, health is going to be a big key in, in both the West, East and the West. But if teams stay healthy, you know, I think that the Nets will probably end up on top uh, because Chicago is playing great right now. But I think the Nets have a lot more talent, especially with Kyrie coming back. Uh, I don't expect the Celtics to be all the way down where they are now. Uh, Philly should move up. They, 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 they're going to be okay. They, they really missed um, <laughs> Simmons, but I think they, they learned how to play without him now. Um, Chicago is going to be a, a battle. Man, is going to be a battle when they get healthy too. So I, I think the East is going to as it go down the wire, you know. And I always say that the, the season doesn't start after the All-Star break. That's when everybody gets serious. And you find out, you know, which teams are going to be at there at the end. And I think those four teams are going to be there at the end. And then the second half, Milwaukee, don't, don't, don't count out Milwaukee. You know, <laughs> you know, they could end up winning it again. So I think this is going to be a great year for for playoff teams, you know, once they get, get the team set, I think it'll be a great year. The matchups is going to be a big problem. But uh, I wouldn't rule out Milwaukee, the Nets, and Philly as one of the top three teams in the East. Coach, in closing, uh, the Phoenix Suns, do you feel like the uh, Suns will be shining uh, late in the year? And uh, how far do you see Phoenix going? I, I think they're going to do quite well the rest of the year. You know, I think that nemesis is going to be uh, – Golden State, because if Golden State get those two guys back, then that's going to be their nemesis, because the only thing I think Golden State missing right now is size. And, you know, they get women back and they get um, Clay back, then they can compete. But Utah is always a danger, because they have size, they have young guys that can play. But I still think it's going to go down the wire between Phoenix and Golden State, and those two teams is going to be there. One of those teams, I think, going to get to the finals. Coach, in closing, are there any final comments you'd like to make as uh, the audience gets to hear from the great uh, Mr. Gar Hurd? Well, you know, I, I always felt that I, I was blessed, you know, like a small time guy from Georgia in the 60s and end up in the situation that I, I was in. Got a chance to play for and work with some of the great coaches in the world. Got a chance to see the greatest player that ever played basketball. So. To me, it, it, it's, I've been living a dream, you know, when, uh, and, and I, I really, I really appreciate all the things that uh, that happened, and because I have a great family, so I, I I've been blessed, you know. I, I'm just uh, blessed that I'm able to sit around and talk about basketball and watch basketball and see the young guys how they, uh, you know, how they grow, and not only talk about basketball, but they were, you know, actually spent a lot of time dealing with life, helping people, you know. And I think that's the whole key, because if you're able to do that, then and, and, and you, you really accomplish a lot. Coach Hurd, in closing, uh, you grew up in Georgia, um, and the civil rights movement was right down the street. Uh, Auburn, uh, the late, great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, can you talk about your impressions of the civil rights movement 
in Dr. King as we approach uh, his birthday once again? Well, you, you know, when, when I was in high school, you know, we really didn't, uh, we, we knew about it, but it was, it was almost like a black and white situation. You know, you, you're on this side or you're on that side, you know, and blacks on this side, whites on that side. So I really didn't get a chance to uh, participate a lot into that because my parents were very, uh, very protective of us. You know, they, they gave us the rules, what we need to do, what we couldn't do. So I, I got a chance to study a lot of uh, Dr. King when I got to college. And I will forget the uh, the year that he was killed. You know, that was the year I had I was landing in the hospital with a knee operation, so I got a chance to do, to watch that, and then did a lot of study about him. Then, but um, he, he, you know, he he was great. You know, he was one of the reasons why we got a chance to to do the thing that we're doing now. And uh, you just can't give him a lot of credit. Uh, you, you can give him a lot of credit for what happened during that time because. He sacrificed his life so everybody else can have a great life. 